Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first session of uh, Restructuring Enlightenment from Karnap's Aufbau to Conceptual Engineering with Reza Nagarastani. Um, I'll just give a brief description of the course before we get starting, and then I'll hand it over to Reza. As a direct continuation of the enigma of Karnap's Aufbau, this eight session course will continue to chart the development of Rudolf Karnap's thought from the problems arising in Aufbau to their solutions in light of Karnap's subsequent works starting from the logical syntax of language to logical foundations of probability. All in all, the aim of this seminar is to make an overall survey of Carnap's main philosophical ambition that begins to crystallize with the Aufbau and the, and the unity of science, that is, a philosophy equipped sufficiently to rethink and restructure the Enlightenment as a project of systematic universalism, where the unity of all sciences and the translatability between statements made within uh, psychological, physical, and cultural domains have not only profound implications for philosophy and science, but also for an egalitarian universalist politics. From the cautious pluralist attitude of Carnap with regard to constitution systems in the FBO, um, to his paradigms of conceptual engineering and the principle of tolerance, Carnap shows his philosophy to be a new philosophy aimed at rekindling the Enlightenment, and that reinvigoration of the Enlightenment which is at once constructive cr critical philosophy is reinvented anew and the project of the enlightenment of enlightenment is restructured in accordance with the developments in areas encompassing science and engineering economy and politics so uh without further delay i'll hand it over to reza uh, thank you everyone uh thank you very much uh hello everyone uh so uh this is our first session um uh, as usual, uh, we always start the class with uh, people introducing themselves, talking a little bit of their background, where they're coming from, and why they have taken the course. And um, I think uh, today, what we are going to do is going to <coughs> um, briefly talk about <coughs> Sorry, uh, the trajectory that this course is going to take um, with regard uh, to the uh, topics that we are going to uh, uh, cover um, down the line. Um, you know, essentially where we are coming from with regard to Karna um, um, and where his philosophy <coughs> is headed after Aufbau, which was the previous uh, seminar. Uh, then we will, um, again, in a kind of like a, a compressed way, we talk about uh, some of the main uh, issues uh, that are significant with regard to Carnap's philosophy's um, um, connections or links with the project of enlightenment. Um, we, will, we will highlight these, briefly talk about them, and next session, we will start, um, you know, our more systematic uh, course, uh, starting from um, a sort of a, the kind of problems uh, within Afbao, uh, of which Karnap becomes aware and lead ultimately to is next major work, logical syntax of language. And of course, logical syntax of language, we talk about this, that how it breaks away from that epistemological concerns or no Kantian core of, of Bao, uh, which is like the early car app, and moves toward um, um, the logic of tolerance, conceptual uh, engineering, and all that, Jazz, basically, the enlightenment that Karras, Andrew Karras thinks that these are basically the core of a renewed enlightenment within Karnam's philosophy. And we will, of course, down the line, we will assess whether they are uh, really the core of enlightenment or simply uh, <clears throat> modified uh, modules of the old enlightenment. Right, instead of being a radical breakthrough, right? So, uh, so I think that's, um, yes. So we start with everyone uh, introducing themselves. Um, 
I don't know who wants to start and uh, you can I pass the mic. Go through the list, would that be easier? Sure, that would be magnificent, yes. Okay, so I'll just read them in the order that I have them. Um, Armand, do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Arma. I'm from Iran. Uh, I don't have much of a background really in anything, uh, but I'm here for, of course, all, um, both Karnat and how um, Senegal Stan thinks about Karnat, but also the reconstruction or re engineering concept, which I think is very interesting. And um, as a follower of Reza's line of thought, I think this. Um, Platonistic project is very is a broad, uh, interesting project that he picks up from Karna uh, to this day, and I'm here for that because I think it's it has a very um, uh, it has very bro broad broader um, implications that only philosophy. So that's that. Alessia, <clears throat> thank, thank you, Armand. Okay, please. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I, I also don't really have any um, uh, kind of like philosophical background. I don't have any specific uh, training, uh, but have a general interest. Um, and the, yeah, that's my second experience, second time taking uh, classes at the new school. So I'm, I don't know, just, uh, just, just interested in general in um, in philosophy and the classes that um, I was finding on the website. So I don't know, not really sure what what to say, you know, at this point. <clears throat> so I anticipate some difficulties, but um, I'm excited as well. So what sort of what sort of uh, philosophy are you familiar with, though? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what, what do you mean exactly? <laughs> like for example, like, just thinkers or, you know, um, uh, a specific school of thought. Um, yeah, well, I recently started reading one of your books, <laughs> um, which is Cyclonopedia. And um, I would that was exciting. I've been reading a bit of Deleuze, but it's hard to read. Um, to read him uh, without a proper uh, um, philosophical background. So I then I started, you know, decided to go um, back to the Greek philosophy and started, you know, kind of like educating myself. That, that's the best one, uh, yes. Yeah, starting from the beginning. So um, yeah, so I, I would say I've been reading things here and there, but then realizing that I need you know, like more information to understand sure. those newer concepts. So I was constantly going back and like reading I see, um, I see. Yeah, things myself. So it's not that I really have, you know, any, you know, like form idea of what kind of philosophy sure, I- Sure, sure. No, that's, that's good, that's magnificent, sure. that's great. Um, so I don't- I, My suggestion that. would be that absolutely stick with uh, your uh, way of doing philosophy. I mean, you can always, I mean, to be honest with you, with philosophy in terms of, um, there are two ways to do it. One, as you doing it chronologically, either backward or forward, right? <laughs> or uh, starting from um, hedging the funds, hedging your cognitive funds on, for example, different periods. Like for example, the Greeks, Plato and Aristotle, medieval Plotinus, uh, Renaissance, Descartes, Spinoza, modern Hegel, Kant, and then uh, 20th century, I don't know, whatever you like to pick. That would be also, that would be a, also a good way to kind of um, having a, a kind of a, forming a synoptic view of philosophy by way of, by way of approaching works from different periods, understanding that philosophy is proud of its history. And it is essentially the history of philosophy that's important, not the philosophers, right? So that actually, that, that idea that you will start from the history of philosophy rather than a specific um, you know, period, uh, that's also a, a very good way to uh, look at it. Plus, you don't get bored mm -hmm. that plodding yourself through 
second book of metaphysics by Aristotle <laughs> is actually not a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I that's the, I think that's a really good suggestion. So I, I I mean I try to read not only philosophy but things you know like around it, some um, kind of studying um, history of arts and some cultural you know aspects around those periods, uh, and like I don't know, that's just yeah I guess just gives sure, it. Sure, sure. Definitely, modern modern philosophy should be if particularly now that you said that history of um, art modern philosophy you should uh, definitely start work on it Kant um, would be basically the main figure yeah <laughs> and the, 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 look I mean you don't need to these books are difficult all of the philosophy is difficult you know when if you are reading like them like a novel yeah everything is so simple but when you get to the nitty-gritty of philosophical arguments and start to really tackle them like a philosopher, then they actually extremely difficult, very difficult. But good thing is that majority of these works, major works in the history of philosophy right now have, you know, hundreds of secondary literature, which are actually, some of them are quite useful. So you can always supplement it with, you know, uh, these, uh, commentaries or, or secondary literature. Oh, well, thank you. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Should I stay? <laughs> <laughs> Should I go? Back? No. Anyway, I'll, I'll see how it goes. I'm excited. But, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Brian. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Kobolars. I, oh, sir, we know each other. <laughs> yeah, we've spoken on Twitter a couple times. Oh, we have seen each other in New York. Have we? Yeah. Yes, you came to my one of my talks. I think Labor of the Inhuman, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure. I've, I've maybe it was a while ago, but um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I um. Well, it's nice to see you again then. I um, have an undergrad in philosophy. I'm mulling over whether or not I want to go to grad school. Big confusing question. Um, I'm here because I'm interested in conceptual engineering. I have been interested in it now for about five years. Um, I've spoken to a couple of the people spearheading it in the ivory tower, the academies, and uh, I was present at the NYU symposium in 2017. And yeah, I'm just, I basically have an unhealthy relationship with conceptual engineering and I want to be even more unhealthy and learn more <laughs> and just lose my mind. And yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Excellent, Ryan, thank you. So next person is Connor. Hello, um, I'm Connor. <laughs> I, uh, I'm currently enrolled uh, an undergrad degree for uh, mathematics at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, but most of my side time is spent with philosophy and it's like nothing serious. It's really just being like, what are you doing online. here? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested in Carnap because I read too much Marx in high school. And um, I think that um, um, I'm like the, uh, what's the quote from the, it's like the man who built this house on sand. I need a firm foundation. Um, and that example would be God, but this one would be Carnap, right? So <laughs> the thing is um, that uh, Carnap actually is the one who builds the house on sand. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, hopefully this house will be a better structure because uh, <laughs> I've been re reading some stuff and I really don't enjoy the, uh, like the reduction of all like philosophy to like Marxology. Which is fun sometimes to learn this about. This is actually Marxism. worse. You you get the reduction of everything <laughs> into something called the given, the Erlen. <laughs> Elementary experience as a logic. <laughs> uh, I've also been watching a lot of um nothing serious, a lot of random lectures. Been really enjoying that. Fantastic. Okay, good. I, lo okay. I love hearing his voice. His voice is fantastic. Yes, his voice is superb. <laughs> and and the beard, of course. The dignitary beard. <laughs> Thank you so much, Connor. Uh, Cassia. Hi everyone, my name is Cassia. Uh, I'm based in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, 
I have a background in philosophy. I'm a graduate student and also have a background in noise and experimental music. And currently I'm writing a master thesis in which I investigate uh, the conditions, the conditions through which the contrast and just the position of counterfactual models of sociality and mind and our own can generate enough friction to concretely transform our transcendental structures of experience, dismantling belief systems and word pictures such as capitalism and patriarchy. And for this, I use mostly Reza's intelligence and spirits, uh, xenofeminism, and Matin's conception of alienation in social dissonance. Thank you so much, Cassia, and great to have you again. Uh, Dilshan. Thank you. I yeah, think Dilshan hi. is on a surgery, that's why. Oh, hello, hi. how are you? <laughs> uh, my name is Dilshan, I'm a medical doctor. I have no background in philosophy. Uh, I took uh, Reza's previous seminar on Karna, so I, I hope to continue this uh, series of lectures as well. So. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. When he says that I don't have any uh, uh, degree in philosophy, he means that I actually can do philosophy better than other philosophers. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just an autodidact, so. <laughs> Those are more dangerous people. <laughs> and, yeah. Are you there, Edna? Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Edna. I'm from Mexico City. Uh, I'm a student of philosophy in undergrad school. And what else? I don't, I don't have too much to say. I translated uh, the last year an interview of Reza, the, the one called Engineering the World, Crafting the Mind. And it's in my blog. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> and great to have you again. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Felipe. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I, I, I don't have an academic background. Um, uh, but um, in the last couple of years, I started uh, watching stuff from the New Center Archive. And accompanying the rise of the new rationalism and fell in love with it. Uh, so right now I'm here uh, and uh, I'm nurturing, when time permits, a very unhealthy love for uh, philosophy and mathematics. And I, I will probably enroll in an undergrad in philosophy here in, in Portugal in September while I do the this this, uh, this this certificate program. I'm over, overall interested in um, uh, philosophical ped pedagogies, and um, um, well, I'm halfway through the Aufbau. I feel a bit unsure of uh, tackling the rest of Carnap's work right now, but uh, why the hell not? Thank you so much for the thanks. Book. Absolutely magnificent <laughs> to have you here. Uh, Maria. Uh, you're still on mute, Maria. We can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, sorry for the sound. I'm very glad to see everyone my name is Maria I'm an art critic so that means that I am more or less familiar with a few of the marks and thought but uh, not the rest of the philosophy <laughs> and I wanted to uh, set it straight uh, and the current up seminar helped me to understand that we do not exactly have to write arbitrary things somehow loosely based on Freud we may make a system this was a huge, uh, I don't know, huge inspiration for me. Yes, actually, to now, today, today I'm, by the way, it's really good to have you here, first of all, <laughs> again. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm reading uh, Kazir and trying to understand his debate with Warburg and how I can make uh, use of it. Any of you, uh, uh, Maria, I don't know, uh, uh, you, 
have you, uh, any of you uh, seen this book that came from Urbanomic on uh, Jean Cavaillé? Uh, there is apparently the, the Jean Cavaillé and Casirer and Karna, they go into some sort of conference and they meet. I don't know, mm -hmm. I, have, I haven't read the book yet, but I'm sure that it's going to be a horrendous outcome out of it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> two, two German, uh, Logical empiricists meet some Frenchies. That's not a really great idea, or Heideggerians for that matter. <laughs> but yes, uh, Maria, that's that was magnificent. Uh, yeah, in fact, there's something I want to actually talk about. There is this book. Um, it's it's a very um, obscure German philosopher, right? Uh, um, uh, his name is Zien. Is, uh, uh, Sophie, is it Zien? Uh, Z I E H N, something like Zien. Never, no, I don't know what you mean. The, the, the pronunciation, how do you pronounce it in Germany? What, Zien? Zien? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me actually give you the. Um, but does it begin with S? With Z. Z. Zien? No, I don't know. It doesn't sound German at all. Uh, it's um, one second. Uh, it's Z I E H E N. Zish. Zish? No, I don't know. Zien. Uh, I don't you, know. Okay, I spell it. Again. Can you? Zien. Zien. Yes, Z I E H E N. Z I E H E N. That's such yes. a, that's I don't know what that is. What is he a philosopher? He's a philosopher, yes. He 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 wrote one book on experience and cognition. And a massive book uh, called System, simply called System. Yeah, the Theodosian, yeah. I think he's German because all of his books are in German. Zien. Ah, Zien. Zien. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought C. No, it's Zien. Yeah, that's German. Zien. It's like Pol. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Sorry. Um, um, so um, yeah, uh, so he he writes this book. Uh, it's, there are fragments of it in English uh, and some other languages, but I haven't seen it wholly translated. It is actually one of the main influences on Carnap and later system theory. You know, um, from Bertrand Fee to uh, Lohmann and all of the, this is really the germ of, because you see, uh, obviously throughout the whole German idealism or German philosophy, high German philosophy, there was this um, high emphasis on systematicity, right? But this is the first book that actually make the concept of system explicit. I will talk about it, and, and you can actually research a little bit about this. Uh, it's a really good book, really good book. Uh, Our next friend. Yeah, the next person is Sebastian. Hi, I'm Sebastian from Mexico. I study literature in undergraduate level. I am great about contemporary art and poetry. I am interested in Reza talk. That's why I'm here. I am not familiar with analytic philosophy, but I am going to do it with this course and my other reading. And that's all I'm happy to be here. That's, that's great. I, I think that you will suffer this class very much <laughs> for, okay. for, for it being analytic philosophy. <laughs> but don't that's worry, good, that's good. suffering, that's good, yes. <laughs> as long as you 
and rolled for it and you're <laughs> basically loving it that's fine suffering is good while you while you love it <laughs> thanks uh, vincent hi my name is vincent i am based in manila I have an undergrad in language and literature. I'm also kind of a philosophy dilettante, but I'm curious about a continuation where uh, Carnap's Alphabet might left off based on the previous seminar. Uh, currently, I'm interested in the design and fixing of concepts in relation to world making and um, a kind of universalist politics. Magnificent. Magnificent. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, By so the way, Vincent, I. Um, my apologies, I have been super overwhelmed. I have read your um, essay. I have put my dairy paws all over it. I will send it to you, the feedback, and then maybe we can actually meet. I will tell you uh, some, some of my feedback. Thank you. Uh, Sophie. Hi, I'm Sophie. Um, I started philosophy years ago um, in my 20s, early 20s, didn't really finish it and um, went on with art and um, I'm now doing art and um, I'm also reading still philosophy and um, I'm especially now interested in the later Carnap and um, also in um, conceptual engineering. And yes, that's why I'm here. Thank you. Sophie is a great artist. We met in Cal Arts. <laughs> Zenobio. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm Zenobio, I'm from uh, Brazil and uh, I'm finishing an undergraduate uh, degree in design. So I'm turning a design designer researcher, but I've had, I, I've had some basic uh, background in chemical engineering and physics in my early beginnings at the, the university but I've, I've dropped out and right now I'm, I, I, I'm holding on to not changing again my, my kind of career to, to philosophy, but I, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep to, to, to doing design and bringing this new- I mean, Design is a, actually a superb uh, discipline that goes uh, uh, with philosophy really well. I mean, people always say that, oh, mathematics goes with philosophy really well. But I think that design is one of those, you know, undervalued uh, uh, disciplines that actually is like a weird sister with philosophy, right? They can go, uh, they can come hand in hand. Um, I mean, I have a few uh, friends uh, who are, basically, um, they got their PhD in design, right? And they basically turn into philosophy of design and they have done magnificent, wonderful jobs. Really great stuff. Yeah, it's absolutely, you shouldn't go to philosophy. I mean, hold your fort in design program, yes. Thank you. Uh, I think that's everyone, unless I've left anyone out. Uh, no, I think that's it. Let's have a, uh, rest uh, for, I don't know, like uh, five to 10 minutes, and then we come back. Yeah, sounds good.
And uh, you can uh, start whenever you... Oh, I was waiting for you. I mean, I don't have anything else to say. Oh, oh okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, you didn't introduce yourself, by the way. Oh, uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't really like doing it, to be honest, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I'm Enda. Uh, I've been in the previous classes. Uh, I'm, yeah, uh, I guess I have a background in philosophy and in art. Uh, I'm kind of somewhere between the two, uh, seeking out communism as the form of the good, uh, or, you know, like that kind of an approach, um, sort of political approach to philosophy or philosophical approach to politics, maybe. Um, but yeah, that's kind of uh, what I'm here for. I mean, yeah, I have thoughts of, about Carnap and everything, but I'll, I'll save them for the seminar. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So um, coming back to our um, class, uh, perhaps it's actually good to talk about a little bit about uh, Afbao, you know, um, of course, we are going to talk about it more in details. I mean, this was for those of you who didn't uh, take the previous seminar, uh, the previous seminar was on Afbao, uh, logical structure of the world, right? Carnap's first major work. <clears throat> um, of course, we are going to next session, we are going to talk about uh, the problems that uh, lead to its downfall, uh, even for Carnap himself, uh, understands these um, shortcomings of, of, the, of uh, his first major work and his radical response to those shortcomings paves the road for what Carnap becomes later, right, as a philosopher of tolerance, logical tolerance and conceptual engineering. Now, um, <clears throat> so perhaps it's best to talk a little bit about the status of logical empiricism or logical positivist. I prefer the term logical empiricism as I have talked about it in the previous seminar rather than logical positivism. Uh, talking about uh, its extremely controversial uh, uh, relation with other philosophies. Think about no rationalism is bad. Think that logical empiricism is worse. It's a brand of philosophy that doesn't want friends. In fact, friends are not good. It, it attacks every single philosophical school of its own time, right? Uh, and that's just not really a good idea in the history of philosophy. <laughs> so, but, but nevertheless, they do it systematically, like, uh, and it's made of, an ex of extremely uh, rich, intellectually rich uh, philosopher, um, with, of course, different political inclinations, but mostly emancipatory. In fact, all of them are emancipatory. It's just that political inclinations can go from uh, extremes of left to kind of uh, centrist liberalism, like Maurice Schellig, Neuroth being on the socialist side. Yeah? And Carnap always being uh, trying to stay away from, um, philosophically speaking, stay away from uh, the hot air of political um, um, adventurism of his time. He's of course famous for you know, being one of the first anti-segregationist philosophers in the US, right? Anti-Nazi, anti-fascist, um, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, his, his activism is quite impeccable uh, for his time. So, yes, so what, why is that this sort of philosophy that is in fact emancipatory creates such a vehement uh, negative response from literally from every other school of thought of its own time? 
to the point that logical empiricism is just means that you are knucklehead dogmatist and nothing more. You are like, you know, it's just it's, uh, quite uh, savage uh, to the point that, so, I mean, the first attack that comes on uh, to Vienna Theoretical is by none other than uh, Quine, you know, to dogmas of empiricism, which caricatures the position of Carnap uh, to an extent. So they, so we should understand that, you know, Quine is on their account. They are all analytic philosophers, right? And, and in fact, Vienna Circle really um, they founded what we now today uh, know as analytic philosophy. So Quine is definitely on their side as, as an analytic philosopher, but he also caricatures uh, their position into dogmas. And of course, this gives a, a certain kind of currency to other people, continental or analytic, which absolutely hate logical empiricism, Carnap in particular. Uh, they, they say, they start to say that, look, if uh, your greatest ally, which is Quine, has turned against you, then that means that you're really in deep trouble. So uh, as a metaphor, I can say this, that the, the hatred of logical positivism started with two dogmas, then came in the 1980s, that people were talking about 10 dogmas of logical empiricism, not just two dogmas. <laughs> So, uh, and this is, there, there is a, actually an essay. It's, it's not, it's, I, I think it's called Seven Dogmas or Eight Dogmas of Empiricism, yes. Um, so, and, and of course, as I mentioned, people also then become the Frenchies and the Heideggerians who absolutely have zero knowledge of what these people are doing. Uh, and um, basically really, um, you know, uh, dismiss them as being extremely dogmatic, parochial, pig-headed, so on and so forth, right? And this is this is kind of like a, a cautionary uh, lesson for all of you who are trying to do philosophy, systematic philosophy, and you go on Twitter and attack your enemies, uh, <laughs> you bully them, <laughs> and so on and so forth. <laughs> I should listen to my own lessons. <laughs> and um, so this is, so we are going to talk about this. And why is that such a systematic form of philosophizing creates such a devastating form of controversy and caricaturization in the history of philosophy to the extent that when you want to insult a philosopher or a position that say, that, oh, this is a positivist. This is positivist, right? You are not, you're not positivists. Like only pigs are positivists, apparently. <laughs> um, we are going to talk about this, uh, but that would be also a, a kind of the, the arch of the narrative of the entire uh, seminar that to show uh, not by excusing Karna position or the entire Vienna circle, but by demonstration showing that such uh, criticisms are vastly water, uh, uh, watered down. <laughs> Meaning that, in fact, there are, you could actually attack them far more vehemently, far more aggressively, but for all the wrong reasons, unfortunately. <laughs> so, Let's start with Carnaps of Bauer. Please, um, those of you who have always been in my classes, you know, whenever you want, uh, uh, because I'm reading the texts uh, and can't see you, just uh, turn on your mic and ask me a question. If you, for example, uh, want 
you know, an explanation, even if, look, this is the most important thing. The majority of the questions are not about real, uh, oh, what do you mean by this argument and that, but sometimes the concepts, like a simple concept, we don't know that concept, right? Uh, just turn on your mic, uh, ask me that, Reza, what does that mean? It just doesn't, it's, we are doing philosophy. I mean, uh, not all of us know everything. I mean, uh, even professional, most professional philosophers sometimes don't know certain kinds of concepts and even in their own discipline, right? So absolutely feel free, interrupt me whenever you want. If there is a time that I don't want to be interrupted, I will say it loud and clear, but that's not the time, right? Uh, so, uh, it is, I think, the idea of, the core idea of the logical structure of the world, which is uh, popularly known as Aufbau, or the structure, um, was founded on one single main problem in philosophy. This is a, a philosophy, as I mentioned, philosophy is nothing but its own history, right? So this philosophical problem that becomes the core of Aufbau and to a great deal, uh, the core of Vienna Circle's uh, work is something that is inherited from the 19th century German philosophy. It is the child of German idealism and 19th century German philosophy. Southwestern uh, no Kantianism, the school of thought, but also, you know, even people like Schelling you know, um, th those sorts of, uh, you know, German idealists. Um, so what is this problem and, or this issue, this concern? Uh, the problem can be characterized as the polarity between Leben and Geist, life and spirit, or life and mind. that literally everything that happens during the phase of high German philosophy is about the clash, not negative, not merely negative, but rather dialectical, dialectical clash between Levin and Geist, life and spirit, life and mind. Philosophy of life and philosophy of mind in the vein of G German idealism. And Aufbau begins with uh, this issue, this main concern that it has inherited from a long tradition of German philosophy. <laughs> This becomes, as I mentioned also, uh, the core uh, um, of any sort of philosophy, not just Vienna Circle, any sort of philosophy that um, arises at the beginning of the 20th century. They are essentially a reaction uh, the turbulent years of Weimar Republic, when no Kantianism um, was the leading major academic uh, form of uh, philosophy or school of thought in Germany, right? Now, Karnap being one of the most ambitious of all bunch in the Vienna circle, um, 
um, had his mind early on, uh, from even before writing of Bao, on precisely resolving the polarity, resolving this conflict, eternal conflict between Leben and Geist, life and spirit. <clears throat> of course, for those of you who were uh, present in the previous seminar, we mentioned that his major uh, attempt, first major attempt, to resolve the, this conflict uh, between uh, life and spirit, or uh, life and mind, uh, was engineered by way of a certain form of eclecticism, that he's outsourcing his philosophy to various schools of thoughts, some of which he actually vehemently hates, or at least thinks that they are basically uh, not worthy of the name philosophy. But nevertheless, he outsources uh, um, his, his philosophy in order to re resolve this issue by way of myriads of schools of thoughts. We talked about no Kantianism, Machian philosophy, phenomenalism, phenomenology, Weidinger's counterfactuals, as if experiment, thought experiments, so on and so forth. He's, he's doing it all. Uh, and then, but these are all, however, this eclecticism is not a sort of arbitrary, whimsical uh, a strategy that uh, you launch simply, that you, that you, that you can simply uh, resolve the eternal clash between Leben and Geist by way of um, uh, resorting to a rabid pluralism, right? That's not exactly his, yes, he's, he's a pluralistic thinker in a, in a methodological sense, but that's not really his uh, main uh, strategy, precisely because all of these methods and the schools of thoughts that he uh, inherits and he tries to outsource his philosophy to in order to resolve the problem, ultimately need to be integrated by the new tool of the new for the new philosophy. And what is that? It's Frege's or post Fregean concept of logic. Logic is the integrative tool. Hence the logical construction of the world, right? That ultimately logical integration of all experiences, that's the key for Karnak. So pluralism in this sense is not pluralism for the sake of pluralism, neither in the realm of methodology nor in the realm of um, attaining a solution uh, to the problem of the clash between life and mind but rather it is um, uh, what you might call to be a necessary step to address different facets of the set clash, but only under the supervision of a renewed philosophy bootstrapped from its met old metaphysical quagmire by a tool called logic, right? <laughs> so,
Can I ask a question here, Reza? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so in the previous seminar and in the introduction to this one, which um, I was reading out at the start as well, uh, you were using the word uh, constitution system. And in the book, it's, it, it speaks of a constructional system. And it's I was constitution. Okay, and, I, and I'm kind of curious um, as to like, uh, you know, is this a purpose of sort of um, uh, use of this term? Because I've seen it also in Kassara where he's talking about a constitution system, but it seems more in a kind of, um, I, I guess, less as a constructive uh, procedure as much as something that might be uh, based on a kind of like a Kantian set, sort of understanding or something like this. You see, uh, the early version, the early version, uh, I mean, the one that at least in Karnak, uh, in, in, in Afal, that we are dealing with, is absolutely constitution. And it is, um, um, for some honest, uh, unspeakable uh, reason, has been translated as construction, yeah, logical construction of the world. But no, it's, um, uh, it's actually constitution. Precisely because, yes, constitution, why? Because Remember, in Afbao, our ground zero element is experience. Experience is what constitutes everything else, right, in, in Karna. The thing is that, however, I'm, this session, this seminar, I'm, use, I'm going to use the word construction. And I'm going to explain why, precisely because the role of experience, the constitutive role of experience for all human sciences is being replaced by the role of construction. Construction in the sense that logic is finally freed from the clutches of human intuition and experience. Right? That, so um, um, I was trying to do a weasel move and kind of like do a flash forward and why I'm using uh, the word construction here instead of constitution that I used to use previous session for Afbao. I'm using the word construction here so I can prepare unsuspected minds for what is yet to come. <laughs> So, um, sorry, yes. So essentially, uh, we should understand of Bao at the very least is under three major influences. Levin's philosophy, philosophy of life, Neo-Kantianism of Hermann Cohen and Paul Latour, which basically, um, it, it plays a major role in Afbao. Remember, Afbao is a book that purports to be an epistemological, logical project about the world, about any statement that we can ever make about the world. So those of you who didn't take the previous seminar, Aufbau has a one single formula in, in the broad sense. It is a book, a project, which has a twofold um, characteristics or characterization. It is epistemological and logical. Epistemological in the sense that it ought to answer to the question of human experience, of what we how of the world that we experience around us. And also it ought to address or respond to the question of logic. How we, we how we construct or how we construct experience, how, how experiences are being constituted, and how we can reconstruct them, we can restructure them, such that we can actually talk about. Felipe has this experience of the world 
And now we can scientifically talking about that specific experience of Felipe, like seeing a red dot turning into purple and not something else and not something else. For us to do that, you need to have a logical pole of this project and not just the epistemological one, logical reconstruction of any sort of experience is the most necessary aspect of talking about any sort of experience. Because if you can't logically reproduce an experience, then most probably you didn't have that experience to begin with. It's just, think about this, a naive example I am using here, uh, a comparative and might be misleading, but for now we hold on to it. Think about this, that there is no scientific fact if it cannot be scientifically reproduced. Have you ever heard that you know, uh, thing? You know, that, look, this is pseudoscience because we cannot scientifically reproduce it, reconstruct it, right? The same thing can be said about experience. If you can't logically reconstruct experience, and most probably is not an experience. It's a pseudo problem of experience. Questions, heckling. Yeah, I, I have a kind of a, 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 a weird idea. I don't know if this would be a, a, a philosophical problem, but could we, uh, without um, like, Having this basic concept of conceptual engineering, I, I've, I, I've read, I've, I've, uh, I've listened to. Could we uh, re not not reconstruct an experience, but kind of make uh, different experiences, or not renewed, but very uh, not not very different, like. Putting the the bringing the the the, the basics the, the, the basic uh, uh, say kind of blocks of experience we have like construct this uh, logical or or with these logics and make something without kind of a kind of a. a, a uh, I, I, I don't know, in Kantian terms, may, maybe uh, synthetic a priori or, or something yes. like that. Zenobia, my apologies. I want to um, be very uh, outspoken, frank. I know that why you are trying to do this. Um, let's, let me do it, the vulgar version of it for everyone. That can we have a goddamn new experience after all? You know, but of course, the idea of a new experience is vulgar precisely because today, oh, I have a new experience, right? Without any sort of criteria of what new, what experience might be, right? Simple as that. Having all that, um, uh, what you might call to be careful, thoughtful factors involved, can we have actually a new experience, right? Of the world, of the furniture of the world. Yes, that is the whole point, though. Kant himself thinks that there is no experience if it does not have an epistemological import. Simple number one thesis of Kant. Now, Carnap goes even further. That is not an experience if it cannot be re logically reconstructed. That doesn't mean that we cannot have a new experience. But for something to be called experience, and not something else, it should have epistemological import a la Kant. But for something to be called an objective experience of the world, it ought to be logically reconstructable. Of course, we are coming back to this with regard to the issue of conceptual engineering that 
conceptual engineering is kind of like a lubricant for having new experiences. My apologies, that sounded wrong. <laughs> Gonna get cancelled again. We've only been we've only been an hour, hour and a half into this. I'm not supposed to make a Stalin joke, so I'm only doing lubricant jokes <laughs> these days. <laughs> so, um, any any questions? Arman has been uh, Arman. You know that Arman is a good friend of mine. Arman has been quite sus suspiciously uh, yes, actually, silent. No, yes, I had a question. <laughs> Of course, you 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 see. Yes, I had a question, um, but I I don't know if I can um, uh, if I can yet um, articulate it properly. That that's that, that was why I was um, hesitant to ask it, but I would try. Um, uh, in what you said about uh, logically reconstructing is uh, reconstructing an experience, and it's different uh, and the difference between the epistemological approach to it and the logic and the pure logical approach to it. Uh, something that when we use uh, the experience as if it is something uh, we encounter in the world um, through our senses and stuff like that, when we try to logically reconstruct that, we um, wouldn't we come to um, at the end an epistemological an epistemological level of the question? For example, let's say I experience no, the no, no, presence it's, of it's, God in. Yeah, I think that in Aufbau, I, I see what you are uh, trying uh, to do. You are uh, trying to do that, look that ultimately, if it is experience, even if the logical reconstruction of it should be subjected to epistemological inquiry, epistemological testing, right? Uh, that's a fairly Kantian position, though. Uh, but the thing is that that is a fundamentally also a wrong-headed position that Carnap realizes this with regard to our cloud. That first of all, when we are saying that logical reconstruction of experience, in order for it, we can call it an objective experience. Because remember, the question of experience is a question that is ought to be understood in terms of objectivity of experience, right? Kant 101 critique of pure reason. <clears throat> and the objectivity, Carla tries to hijack it in, uh, on behalf of the logical reconstruction and not epistemology. That objectivity comes from the logical reconstruction. Now, the thing is that in Aufbau, even in Aufbau, as we talked in the last seminar, the, 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 the sort of logical relations and logical reconstructions that we deal with early on for elementary experiences, like, for example, a spatiotemporal similarity relations, are extremely rudimentary. They don't even have what you might call to be um, epist epistemological input, really. They, they, they are basically quality classes that are that are being organized that are being organized uh, by way of logic as a tool. I, I will talk about this. That in fact, Carnap has an essay um, under recognized essay called Chaos. I have forgotten the the, the full title of it. Chaos. So chaos is really about this. Chaos is that at what level we can say that our project of reconstruction of experience begins. Or, or we can say that we have an experience of the world, whatever. It says chaos, chaos. What is chaos? Conflux of sensory data. Sensory data that can be, can be um, ordered, hence transition from chaos to order, which is the main motif of Aqbao, from, from having nothing to say about the world to saying 
statements, objective, factual statements about the world. That transition is transition from chaos to order in, in a Kantian sense, from the conflux of sensory data to objective and critical judgments about the world statements. Now, this transition at, at the most elementary primitive level is conducted by um, creating quality classes of similarity relations between sensory data. That itself is a logical task and not an epistemological. So essentially this later on becomes a, a big, uh, what you might call to be um, revelation for Karna, that he had it already, the answer to all of this, that it is logic that ultimately makes experience. By, by attaching or by, by, by ordering chaos, and chaos would be the sensory data and their relations, similarity relations in the first place. Sorry, is logic um, absent in the chaos? Logic is absolutely absent in the chaos. Logic is the ordering transition in, in, in uh, early, in early card, in early card. Uh, Brian, I, I think I thought that you want to ask a question. Yeah, I was wondering then, um, could we then, can, like, um, could we then say that we could start the other way with logic that then um, would allow us to experience something unexperienced before? That so is, that is absolutely the whole case. That, uh, that's a, that's a more mature car now, beginning from the logical syntax. So it's about um, you know conceptual engineering would be rearranging those preconditions of experience in a Kantian sense, such that we may then have a new experience. Absolutely. And allows us precisely because it shows us the possible ways of reconfiguring these chaotic elements. It also points to the limits of experience, transcendental experience, trying to mark or test its own limits. From Carnap's perspective, it is impossible to do that. And that is one of the main issues that he has with no Kantians and Kant in particular, that transcendental experience cannot be the source of its own critique. It's blind to its own pitfalls, its own shortcomings. Epistemology is blind to the blights of its own shortcomings in, in this sense as well. It's logic that takes a new role. So this is, this is the, the moment that Carnap, beginning from the logical syntax of language, which we will talk about, begins to simultaneously move away both from his Phrygian uh, dogmatism and from his uh, no Kantian uh, influences. The question from Felipe. Hi, um, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I, I don't know if this this is a jump, but uh, by distinguishing early Karna from later Karna, so. Um, what he uh, at first classified the, the ordering, the, the ordering of experience, the ordering of the the, the previous conflicts of sensory data, uh, and from that to the later Carnap, which is the one who talks about conceptual engineering as the reordering of the initial those initial condition conditions. Uh, can we say that um, this conceptual engineering through logic 
is the self-correcting uh, facet of reason? This specifically, this, or this is just a, a vague uh, metaphor? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's self-correcting. I don't. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it is. But um, we we are going to when we get to the logical syntax of language, we are going to read this uh, magnificent essay by. Uh, Steve Audi and Andre Harris called uh, the dream of infinite ocean. Uh, uh, it's on Carnap's logical syntax of language versus Wittgenstein's idea of language, which they, they call it uh, uh, the Kantian straitjacket or, or Wittgenstein in prison. Um, I would say that uh, this this is not even self-correcting precisely because you see when we are saying you know transcendental uh, uh, structure transcendental philosophy uh, and transcendental logic by extension as an as an extension of it already have this idea of self-correction self-correcting reason we have it in sellers we have it in no kantianism uh, so on and so forth but the thing is that as i mentioned uh, just to brian and armand is that one of the main issues here is that how can experience, transcendental experience, rectify its own shortcomings? If you are already in a prison, right? If you have, if, if the view of experience being the primary is itself parochial, how that sort of parochialism can unparochialize itself? Right? That's, that's something that Carnap begins to work from after off Bob by showing that you can't expect objective experience to criticize its own shortcomings, its own pitfalls. You need to bring a an element which is not experiential, but out of which all experiences are constructed, or by way of which, not out of which, my, my apologies, by way of which all experiences are being constructed. Uh, I think Connor has a question there as well. That's all right. Hello. Um... I was wondering, I don't know if this is off topic or taking us away from anything, but how fair would it be to compare the um, project of rational reconstruction to, um, I'm sorry to bring this back to Brandon because everything, I'm kind of obsessed with him right now. Um, meaning use analysis, like in is from his John Locke lectures, where it's like um, a strict um, vocabulary describes another, like a, a set of practices and abilities to describe other things would you like say that rational reconstruction with like logic as that's not rational history? reconstruction though uh, rational okay, reconstruction okay. in in Carnap is a very a specific project that intermediates mm -hmm. between of bows epistemic logical dimensions and later conceptual engineering rational reconstruction yeah mm -hmm. i mean in brandom's is a different meaning in brandomian's uh sense but in Carnap, rational because uh, structure is fundamentally different uh, we will talk about this but yeah i know what you're uh, uh, talking about in terms of that conceptual safe conceptual engineer these are two different fundamentally do two different categories uh yes um conceptual engineering or explication is absolutely that uh but it's even more than, more than that, precisely because there is an element of tolerance, logical tolerance, meaning that you can make your own concept, I can make my own concept. It's just that if you are going to make your own concept, you'd better be prepared to put every in extreme case, in extreme case, this usually doesn't happen, but you should be prepared in extreme case and you should get, you should have read it already to make the syntax, the logical syntax of your language 
as explicit and as clear as possible. You cannot just make some co new concepts without clearing or putting on the table the toolbox you use to create that kind of concept. And that would be logical syntax. Essentially, this is, I think, people care says that Karnap is a hero of pragmatism, right? And um, I don't believe in this. I actually, uh, Karnap hated pragmatism for the most part. Pragmatism, he thought it's wishy-washy. You know, oh, we have the meaning as use. What, 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 when you are saying use, what sort of, or, or this kind of explicitation of vocabularies, what sort of tools are you using to explicitize a vocabulary? What sorts of tools are you making methods uh, or syntax in this logical syntax are you, has gone to your concept? Is it kosher or not? Right, philosophically kosher or not. Uh, so, in fact, I think uh, Mormon, uh, who is another uh, great commentator on Karnap, is right. I think the idea. I mean, this is this is every. I think that I feel that once in a while, um, history of philosophy usually tends to people who have been wronged to bring them back. And Karnap is absolutely one of them. Absolutely has been wronged in the history of philosophy, caricaturized by people who absolutely don't know nothing about him. Uh, but they actually make really uh, ridiculous ideas in order to basically dredge him up from the, you know, from the swamps of philosophical history by saying that, oh, he's the, one of the greatest pragmatists of all time. No, goddamn. Karna is not pragmatist. You don't need to overinflate Karnap's pragmatic uh, commitments to render him as a martyr of American pragmatism. He's not. Could, could I ask on this point, um, unless anyone else had something, whether, whether this is kind of, um, you know, uh, Karnap speaks about the uh, functionalization of the concept or object, which is not a reification, but a kind of, um, you know, a, a, yeah, I guess like a, it has a functional role within a constitution or a constructional kind of system, right? That's not a lo logical rule, that has logical role that only becomes palpable with logical syntax. The functional role has always been the logical role. And the thing that Karna thinks that this, log, this functional role ha had been hamstrung by his misguided overemphasis on epistemology, I don't know, Kantianism, right? We are, we are going to talk about, but that's, let me, functional. Okay, my apologies, one second. Give me one second, one minute actually, I will be back.
my apologies, sincere apologies. <clears throat> Any more questions before I move forward? Sophie, I have a job for you. Uh, you are going to pronounce this title for us in German. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to read it. <laughs> Here. Of course, okay, I understand. Um, Erkenntnistheorie auf psychophysiologischer und physikalischer Grundlage. <laughs> Good, that's great. <laughs> Tell us uh, your version of uh, translation. Oh my goodness. Um, oof. Um, Erkens theory is like a, a is co cognitive theory or, or um, yeah. Yeah, cognition theory um, of psycho, <laughs> physio, like body, no? Like um, physical, logical, uh -huh, uh -huh. and um, um, Physic, like physic. Like, this is why no one should learn German. They can't <laughs> even translate their own titles. I mean, I don't understand. There are like three words and one in this. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was saying that uh, the th three main influences of Karnapinov, Bao, one was, as I uh, mentioned, no Kantianism. The other one was, um, uh, what was it? The, uh, the life uh, philosophy, philosophy of life, you know? And the last one is a, a sort of a Machian, or Ernst Mach, Machian monism. Um, uh, which is uh, whose main proponent during the time of uh, Carnap's early age, early philosophical uh, works, is uh, Theodor Zien. Um, and this is his book, his, his main uh, book. Uh, we can call it just simply cognitive theory, cognitive theory, right? Now, um, now, it, it seems that, you know, he's, he's just, as I mentioned, he's outsourcing his philosophy too much in order to resolve the clash between life and spirit. But actually, it is not. Uh, precisely because... Um, all of these... Um, what you might call to be all of these schools of thought, Levin's philosophy, Hermann Cohen, Natorps, Neo-Kantianism, and the, the Machian monism, their ultimate goal is to shed light precisely on the clash between um, life and the spirit. There are what you might call to be different apertures opened up to the same problem. Now, the, the before of Bao, uh, I think it is actually not published. Um, the, 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 his work called uh, Chaos, Karnap's Chaos. Uh, I mean, it's published now, but at the time it was not published. It was an unpublished manuscript. Uh, and they, they are the main, these influences, they are the main, uh, driving forces of uh, chaos, which you might call to be the Ur of Bao, you know, the original of Bao before even of Bao was written. Uh, Sophie, this is the uh, thing you are going to read for us again. Don't worry, we are going to pay you. New Center money is good. Oh, it's easy. From um, chaos to wealth. 
That's easy. Uh, from chaos and to world. From chaos to world, yes. That, that I mentioned to you uh, that this is simply the ultimate ambition of Karnaps of Bao, from chaos to world, from chaos to system, ordered reality, a structuration, a structured reality, but a structure not in a sense that what you might call to be fascism or fascistic dogmatic kind of worldview, where basically we everything that we have is, is super chaotic and we are move, we are going to make an order, a new order out of this, a new world order. No, essentially what he's interested in is the old fashioned good tried and true enlightenment. What is the project of enlightenment? That science, ultimately, or sciences, allow us to make a transition from a confused world conception to increasingly more robust, subtle world conceptions. Uh, Karnaps should to give me some money for standing him like this. <laughs> Go on, Cassia, my apologies. Uh, Reza, can this problem of the clash uh, between life and experience be translated somehow uh, in trying to think the relations, the possible relations that we can envision between uh, formal languages, the use of formal languages and the use of natural language? because this confusion and ambiguity of natural language is a, a great concern of Carnap in the, in the early absolutely. works. Yes, yes, absolutely. So yes, in fact, it starts from experience to kind of a logically, logically reconstruct experience in Afbao. But later on, it becomes from natural language to formal language, and from formal language to something better, explication, whereby you can actually create, explicate the concept of probability. And through the explication of the concept of probability, re-understand the nature of language itself, natural language, logical probability, 101. So you see that this is a, there is a twist in this. It's not simply saying that, oh, well, you know, we are moving from natural language, clunkiness of natural language to formal language. Quine also has it. But with Carnap, there is a certain ingenuity, ingenuous twist at the end. The transition from natural language, the vagueness or in, in, in inexact concepts forged in natural language to formal language where you can make potentially more exact concept coincides with the possibility of an account of a machine that can capture all the richness of la natural language and even more, and even more. That, that's the computational thesis that is at the late chapters of logical foundations of probability. We are talking about it. We are going to talk about that. Why then Carnap seems to be quite aware that if this is the course of enlightenment, that what you just said is the course of enlightenment ultimately moving from inexactitude given to us by way of natural languages, experience, or the manifest image, allocellars, toward more exact scientific this, that coincides with AI, 
artificial intelligence in the strongest possible sense. And that's, I think, is not uh, a haphazard result. I think that pro most probably Karnap had already thought about it. Because this is exactly the thesis that Solomonov, who, who used to attend Karnap seminars in the US, later on develops into Solomonov's account of universal or optimal learning machine. The need for the classical idea of subject in the Kantian sense is finally rendered redundant. Not object, simply obj objects in its entirety, but the Kantian idea of subject in that a specific sense that Karnap had been using since Afbao or chaos is being rendered redundant. We don't need it. We can, we can actually, all of the stuff that the subject could do, and we attribute it to the subject, such as having experience, having authenticating experiences uh, to factual, as a matter of factish statements, can be done by a machine. A machine that reconstructs the principles of having experience in the first place. Sorry, why wouldn't you call the machine a subject and we would get rid of the subject? Do you understand my because that, that would create a lot of confusion, you know, right? You know, he's on a shit list of every person who actually believes in, in, in Kantian subjects at this point. So he doesn't want to <laughs> basically does that again. And the idea, uh, remember, um, I don't know what you actually uh, watch uh, all of the sessions of the previous seminar. There was a session that, by the way, where is Gabriel? Gabriel Neves. He asked a question, really great question, that do you really think, and I said that, well, I have to think about it. He said, that, do you really think that Karnaps of Bao ultimately leads to the redundancy of subjecthood. Mm -hmm. And do you believe I think, in that? I think so, yeah. It um, does. Wouldn't be, would it be not, wrong not subject, to call it that? It, it's what you might call to be, it, it creates an extremely, it doesn't, it doesn't get rid of the subject, it creates an extremely deflationary account of subjectivity. Yes. Uh, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't what uh, finally comes out of Aufbau as the result of the project, um, would, wouldn't we call that a subject? Uh, I mean, the whole construction of the constitution system uh, isn't the goal of it to uh, explicate this very term of subject. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely. This is definitely so. I mean, um, it's all about explication at this point. So yes, a universal learning machine in a Carnap sense, um, it doesn't call it a universal learning machine, it just call it, uh, I, I forgot in the, uh, Sophia will, uh, Sophie's <laughs> missing in action. Uh, I, will, I will send it to Sophie. There is actually quite a, a nice word for it. Uh, yes, I think that yes, if you are, talking about explicating the concept of subject such that we are not talking about the commonsensical idea of subject, nor we are talking about Kantian subject, but rather that Kantian subject itself is comprised of different levels of activities and characterization. And in that sense, yes, Carnaps doesn't actually get rid of the idea of subject, but rather explicate replace the, the replace the explicandum which we call the subject with an explicatum a more exact concept which call subject two or subject three as a you know a, a subscript marker for it mm. let's hold on 
we have great people who might have problem with some of these. We are not going to go all the way in doing this stuff, naughty stuff in high philosophy. Some of people are autodidact here, including myself. And we need to explain it in uh, simple terms. So, uh, Alicia, um, any questions here? I know, I'm sorry, we, we have got overboard with these super technical stuff, but please ask us like a couple of questions. So I know that, you know, you can actually getting the links, you know, you don't need to, at this point, you don't need to get the, the full picture, right? But nevertheless, it's important for you to get vignettes of this discussion. And now, of course, you can always integrate them as you move forward. Uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. I, I feel like I might need to, uh, you know, digest that a little bit. I feel like it kind of overall makes sense. Um, I guess when it gets into details, I'll like start Googling is there, stuff. Is there, for example, a concept, a line of thought, even the simplest one just doesn't matter. Like even a word, for example, you have- a Yeah, I actually have a- Go on, go on then, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's uh, just wanted to clarify uh, the concept that you use for it. So when you talked about the clash of uh, life and spirit. Um, so what was the word for life? And I'm curious mm -hmm. about what that Sophie, how are you doing? <laughs> Drawing again. It's um, Leben. Leben. Leben, yeah. Leben, Leben. Leben, not Leben. Leben. Okay, 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 okay. Cool. This is why you should not, not learn German. It's not going to be <laughs> working well. Yes, life and a spirit. But I mean, a spirit in the sense, I mean, the word Geist is extremely complex. Mind collective intelligence, collective intellect, all of this stuff. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Sophie, what is exactly guys in German? <laughs> Sophie is our Siri that is specifically made in German language. <laughs> <laughs> I think you explained it quite well, no? With the collective consciousness of- I Yeah, collective, I collective consciousness or yeah. self-consciousness, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I promised asking more silly questions, but- No, 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 no. These, are, these are important. These are absolutely important. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, don't worry. You are, we are going to have a, 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 by the way, I haven't responded to your email. Uh, now I'm going to respond to your email. <laughs> right, about the readings. Yeah. Um, um, yes, I mean, so, so there are these kinds of stuff that are going already in Carnap's work. Um, my apologies. Um, uh, your chat has a question, Reza, if you've got a minute. Sure, sure. Yeah, hi, uh, Reza, sorry, I had two questions and one suggestion. No, you uh, can't have two questions and one suggestion. You can only have one question. <laughs> Go on okay. now. <laughs> no, I'm just okay. kidding. <laughs> okay, okay. The, the distinction you draw between uh, life and mind, uh, I'm curious about the exact definition of, of what it means. What do you mean by life and what do you mean by mind? Because, you know, if, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the pragmatic distinction of Erlebnis and uh, Erfahrung, if I'm pronouncing them correctly. You know, the different, uh, so pragmatists talk about, uh, you know, elevenness in, in, term, in the sense of experiential life and uh, referring in terms of, you know, like what Brandon calls the thought cycle, test of yes. test cycle. So uh, yeah. I'm curious about whether do you mean by life in terms of experience or- No, 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 that would be just pragmatism. 
That's not German idealism. That's absolutely not. Essentially, this is, I would say, that the complete um, misrepresentation of German philosophy that unfortunately uh, Brandon tries to hijack the richness of this dialectical clash between life and mind uh, in the name of life. American pragmatism and particularly his own brand. I love Brandon, I love Brandon, but unfortunately that is not the case. So what do you mean by life in purely biological? I don't no, know, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. No, and life actually in um, uh, German idealism absolutely has nothing to do with biology. It has organicism, it has organicism, but that is not really fully what you might call to be, can be subsumed within biological theories of, uh, that we have at this point. Uh, no, it, it is definitely, um, what you might call to be life, both life and mind uh, are instances of the holistic philosophy, all right? But obviously this brings a question, then why is that, you know, if they are both holistic philosophy, then why is that they are in a clash? Because they, they have specificities. And the task of German philosophy for a great long time is to highlight the specificities of these two interconnected wholes, life and mind. It's not as if life is against mind or mind against life, but the German philosophy, high German philosophy begins with this idea and this is uh, before the rise of German Romanticism, in fact, that even though they are uh, sharing the same ground, have some commonalities, both holistic concepts, but obviously we cannot simply equate life with mind because that would create a massive amount of philosophical confusion. So, German philosophy begins with this idea that insofar as we cannot align the distinction between these two wholes, characterized as such, and of course they, these characterizations do change in the, in the high German philosophy, then how can we integrate them at the end of the day? Integration rather than fusion, that's the important one. Mind is different from life. That doesn't mean that they cannot be integrated though. But as I said, integration is not fusion. It's not that we are going to turn them into one thing. Uh, okay, can, I, can I go to the second question? Sorry. Sure, sure. Yeah, in the previous seminar, I read a few papers uh, by Andre Karras and another philosopher, Jeffrey something, I don't remember his second name. You know, the, even the title of the, the, the paper uh, were called, you know, Carnap's Voluntarism. They continuously ascribe his philosophical inclinations as, as voluntarist. And I remember we asked you during the It's seminar, not so really voluntarism, to be honest with you. In fact, it, I would say it's completely the opposite. Uh, it starts from extremely, look, the, both on the philosophical and political level, the project of Vienna Circle begins with a voluntaristic uh, position, right? But I would say that uh, middle and late corner, no, absolutely not. That doesn't really hold any ground, that sort of, because I mean, isn't it the whole point of conceptual engineering and post-logical syntax, the idea that we basically, that experiences are being made by something fundamentally impersonal, right, called logic. In being reconstructed, that is against any sort of voluntaristic thesis, right? And, and the thing is that I, 
this is something that Karis hasn't done that. To be honest with you, Karis is a really good reader, but as I mentioned, is getting a little bit too overexcited about Carnap's uh, political agenda and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, doesn't exactly. matter though, doesn't matter I remember, though. I remember you answered, you said, you know, inter, uh, voluntarism requires some symbol of intersubjectivity. But for Carnap, you know, the auto-psychological determination is what constitutes, you know, intersubjectivity itself. So intersubjectivity comes later, so they uh, come Absolutely, and in, and in the later works also, in the inter that, look, intersubjectivity, when we are talking about intersubjectivity, we also need from, if we are becoming mature Carnapians, we have to, we have to explicate it. What do we mean by intersubjectivity? At what level? When we were saying intersubjectivity, do we mean something like this shoddy Habermasian rational communication? Or do we mean uh, uh, something more like a Kantian idea of intersubjectivity, that every, object, if every objective claim is intersubjective? That's also Husserl's thesis, right? Or do we mean intersubjectivity as being determined by logic. So Carnap is on the latter. This doesn't mean that his is is uh, he, he doesn't he, he basically gets rid of the uh, uh, thesis of intersubjectivity in its entirety. No, it doesn't. It's just that his intersubjectivity takes place at a certain level that does not allow this, those or certain kinds of volunteerism that we usually associate with intersubjectivity as an explanandum, meaning an inexact colloquial common sense idea of intersubjectivity, whether philosophically or not. I don't think that Carnap is a voluntaristic thinker at all, but that doesn't make him uh, a philosopher that uh, wants to uh, basically throw the baby with the bathwater with regard to the, the question of intersubjectivity. Uh, the last point, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm the last one to tell you how to teach, but if, if it's not too much, can you please, when during, yeah. Uh, le the lectures can you share th the points that you are you know, teaching from because some you know sometimes it's difficult to concentrate on what you are saying because you know we are not okay how about this from next session not this session uh, this uh, from next session i would create you know i i know what i'm going to talk about even though probably all of you have noticed that i'm a free styler when it comes to teaching i i don't want a script. I think that's that's just not that's rude to people. Yeah, I understand. Just to, for example, you know, I will, I will, I will definitely. I know. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to say that I know what I'm going to talk about, even though I give myself some liberty to how do it. But I will definitely make a list, like four or five max per session. That these are the kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about, like the punchlines. Um, I will definitely include some styling jokes too. People have told me that I shouldn't actually make jokes, styling jokes, but they didn't say me that I cannot make jokes about styling jokes, whatever they might be. <laughs> uh, I think Maria has had a hand up there that uh, Maria wants to ask a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask. Uh... Uh, where we can find the live philosophy uh, in uh, Karnap. I thought it might be perhaps air lab, how we perceive things, and uh, quasi-analysis is some kind, some kind of colloquial uh, agreement between people, uh, but I understand it uh, incorrectly, of course, because this is a Heideggerian understanding of uh, talks between people and yes. why we cannot assess truth. Uh, this is the Heideggerian reading of life philosophy, but Karnaps is different, and I wanted to understand how different it is in, in what aspects. Essentially, this is, this is a really tricky question 
uh, really good question. Yeah, Heidegger is a bloated uh, a living philosopher, right? Uh, living philosopher. Um, Sophie is uh, looking at me weirdly. Um, in the sense that he wants to talk about life as if we had a concept of life. As if a concept of life was given to us in the fact of having an experience. But that's obviously nonsense, right? How can the concept of life can be given to us by something that is going to become life for us, the concept of life? That's, that would be just a vicious circle. So what we are going to do, it begs the question. So what Karna was trying to do is saying that, look, our idea, this is actually, is already, see, philosophers, when they are good and they are great, actually, I have noticed that they have a gift, the Socratic gift, Platonic gift that even if you're talking out of my apologies, your bottle when you are young, but nevertheless, you are talking about certain kinds of main important issues. For so many years, you forget about them, but they always come back and haunt you. And then you notice that. This has always been the motif, the underlying problems of your own work. But that doesn't happen until a philosopher becomes mature intellectually, not by age, but by, by intellect. The same thing about Karna. So Karna already sees all of this in Afbal. It's just that he doesn't have a way to articulate them as the main issues, as the underlying issues behind all of his works. It is only later, after, after, after negating his earlier works, that he comes back and, and rescues some of the most important parts of his earlier philosophy. The same thing about this about the question of life. Um, the question of life for him happens, as I said, on, on two different levels. One at a very basic level, meaning that we have sense data. That's life. If you have sense data, you're a living creature. But since that doesn't, doesn't tell us anything about what life is, does it? It's chaos, as he says, chaos. You need to bring it into an ordered, ordered system, namely a world. And only then you can reflect back on what life is. Stage one of this project, stage two, Let's assume that we indeed create that sort of organization, that orderly world that could reflect on the relations and relata between the sensory data, we created experience, and then we could reflect upon the experiences that we have as humans, regardless of our cultures, but then we can have, through the same kind of systematicity, create a sort of reflective perspective, apertures, camera, on our experiences, which are quite context sensitive, culturally and politically. And that this becomes the fundamental aspects of the late car lab, to move from experience one to experience two to experience three, which is from completely context insensitive 
to completely context sensitive experience, culturally and politically. That, the, that this is a trajectory of really the enlightenment to shed more lights, not just, my, my apologies, not just to shed more lights on the experiences we have, bottom up, but also being capable historically and belatedly to criticize and if possible, change the very experience of the world we had. I have a follow-up question to this, if it's okay. Um, if I'm not under, uh, misunderstanding what's going on here, you could maybe make the analogy with uh, what Carnap is doing and what Carnap conceives philosophy to be, uh, as in some sense, uh, building of the armature that that is kind of uh, like both retrospective to experience, but also con conditions the possibility of future experience in a sense. And of course, I'm not saying that there is some kind of primordial experience that happens before any of this is always kind of uh, along a continuous line. But nonetheless, I, I'm not sure other than in terms of like negative constraints on on uh, you know, what the possibility of future different new experiences uh, might be. Does this philosophy have anything to say in terms of practices um, or is that, are the, would that be the same thing or am I being quite like- No, no, I mean, you're, you're bringing a question. This is, I think that this question hard to answer. Do you know why I actually saw that you were brought uh, uh, John uh, Dewey as a um, pragmatist uh, critique of Carnap. Look, Carnap, for all of his life, uh, stick to a very systematic distinction between theory and practice. Absolutely, under no circumstance, he would have given this away. Because that's Carnap, that's not goddamn pragmatist. To be honest with you, I am on the side of Carnap on this level. I'm a Platonist. Uh, so what does Plato actually talks about? You know, what does the distinction between theory and practice translate to mature Plato, the king of all philosophers? What is it? He, try, he basically identifies this distinction between techne, technique and episteme know-hows and know-whats. So in everything that we do, in fact, in how we concept, make a concept about a thing, about an object, like pendulums, we go back and forth between know-hows and know-whats. Some of our know-whats, how we know that this is such and such, kind of object requires know-hows of how we are going to deploy some sort of concept, so on and so forth, and the other way around. Know-hows and know-whats can always decompose to one another. Most probably, and the thing with pragmatism is that majority of the know-whats can be decomposed to know-hows. But ultimately, all know-whats can be decomposed to know-hows, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, actually fortunately, they don't want to turn this into some sort of that every sort of criteria of speaking about the world as we know it can be simply reduced to the techniques of knowing the world. Otherwise there would be Latourians. Because isn't it the whole idea of Latour, you know, that every know what's knowing what about the world will be ultimately reduced to knowing how to approach the world, simply to tools and toolboxes and stuff. So pragmatism doesn't want to do that, right? 
But I think that Carnap was too polite to put an end to this charade of American pragmatism by saying that what is your safety trigger for the pragmatist thesis to not in fact fall into Latourian pitfall? For that every know how, know what episteme to be reduced into techne, to know hows. And simply, you will no longer ask questions about the world, but you simply think that techniques is your final solution to approaching the world. No, I think the Carnap is far more subtle, and I absolutely take side with Carnap for even wrong-headedly, even wrong-headedly, but what I don't think, I don't know, well, the man is dead, um, would be magnificent if we could ask him this question, but I would say that I actually think that the fact that he sticks to the hard distinction, not hard distinction, to the distinction, to a distinction between theory and practice to his death, is absolutely magnificent. I think that any person, for the sake of creativity, for the sake of making, for resolving the problem, tries to um, lower the boundaries between the two, will end up doing some really shoddy philosophy. By that I mean, Harmon level of shoddiness. So Reza, uh, how can we then uh, interpret the your uh, your claim in intelligence and spirits about uh, the coincidence of ethics and logic as both a system of uh, recognitions and a system of cognitions? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, um, you know, that whenever I actually, someone asked me about that, so Reza, what do you think about your, uh, this thing? And, you know, now I'm thinking that, oh shit, I'm now in trouble now. I wanted to go to tell uh, Cassia that, look, uh, this book came in 2018. And sorry, I think that it's shit book. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> as always. <laughs> but but the thing is that I think this is actually an interesting question. I need to think about this, but let's look about this with regard to the question of Vienna Circle. Vienna Circle uh, position with regard to the question of ethics, right? Obviously there are, I mean, uh, people like um, um, Maurice Schellig, Noroth, uh, uh, Feigl, even Carnap, they hated the idea of morality, moral philosophy, moral philosophy. No, I mean, moral philosophy in the technical sense, moral philosophy. But they, they nevertheless, they had an idea of ethics. So, <clears throat> one of, uh, of course, we are going to take this whole introduction because we are running out of time uh, to the next session. One of the things is that early Carnap, like really baby Carnap, um, was into value theory, axiology, really, theory of value theory, axiology. But the thing is that he, ex that was Rickert, Rickert uh, um, influence on Carnap. He fundamentally uh, put it behind, but then he came back to Rickert and started to, Think about value theory. The same thing as Herbert Feigl. Um, and a bunch of others. Um, for them, this became the whole idea of the Vienna Circle, the idea of logical reconstruction of experience and so on and so forth. Um, was not uh, excluding 
the sort of social, political, mutual recognition, the activist part of the inner circle. In fact, in his own autobiography, Carnap talks about this. And he references uh, Feigl, Herbert Feigl, his friend. Uh, where it's a, it's a book where Feigl actually comes up with a term that later Carnap uses, it's called scientific humanism. Scientific humanism. Scientific humanism is what you might think about this idea of cognitive, recognitive humanity taken into a political uh, a stratosphere. This is, this is uh, what they talk about. Um, my apologies, one sec. So, this is 1949, Feigl's um, um, work. He says that scientific humanism is a moral position comprised of the following four principles. One, human living conditions and life should be improved. Two, whatever can be done to improve human living conditions and life is a task of human beings themselves. In quotes, man has no supernatural protectors or enemies. That's, that's actually quite Promethean in its, you know, the fact that humans are alone In, in this task should be heralded, should be uh, hailed as a, a positive constraint, as an enabling constraint, right? You don't want gods or nature uh, being uh, the one who dictates. So that's, that's Promethean 101. So number three, many sufferings can be avoided. Four, science is one of the most valuable instruments in the improvement of human living conditions and life. Now, the other principles identify whose task this is, what can be achieved, and the importance of science in this endeavor. Carnap himself writes, mankind is, a, is able to change the conditions of life in such a way that many of the sufferings of today may be avoided and that external and internal situation of life for the individual, the community, and finally for humanity as a whole will be essentially improved. Scientific humanism considers science one of the most valuable tools in achieving these aims. Hence, Carnap continues all deliberate actions, presuppose knowledge of the world, that the scientific method is the best of acquiring knowledge, and that therefore science must be regarded as one of the most valuable instruments for the improvement of life and collectivity. Now, this is, see, this is just like early in the, 20th century. Um, I'm going to talk about this more as we are moving forward. But yes, sci this, this sci idea of scientific humanism is precisely what captures uh, elements of Vienna Circle's vision or version of ethics, where you need, even though you have distinguished between theory and practice, but nevertheless, you need to create a certain kind of practice that make what is already implicit in society, namely mutual recognition, cognition and mutual recognition, concretely explicit. But the thing is that Carnap never talks about any of this, right? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it. Um, Carnap, in fact, has um, something that he talks about that 
with regard to the principle of tolerance that look, not all everyone should uh, do the political work. Some people should, you know, uh, will will always be in their in the recluse mode, away from human society. Some people will do this rather than other. Some people will never actually publish any philosophical work. But that is the whole beauty of it. Because Carnap takes the idea of cognitive division of labor seriously. And he wants to say that you cannot do any of sorts of political projects transgenerational transgenerational projects without a very strict mode of cognitive division of labor. The cognitive division of labor is absolutely important for Carnap, particularly late Carnap. Look, I don't need to know everything about science to do my philosophy nor an artist should know everything about philosophy or science. But nevertheless, we can build bridges. That is the whole point. Building bridges between late forms or modes of cognitive labor, that's the final end of enlightenment. And I think that will be it. I think there's a question from Arman here, if that's all right, Reza. Sure, absolutely. If, if you've run out of time, I can ask it the next time, that's okay. <laughs> or on a uh, private <laughs> chat. <laughs> or a private chat, that's okay. Um, by the way, I don't know. Should I ask it or should I, should we stop? Yeah, absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. Okay. Um, my question is about the, uh, um, the, the, the relation, exactly what you said about the bridging and the relation between, or the bridge between practice and theory. Uh, but uh, what, I, what, I, what I don't understand is when you, when you, under, when you um, build a theory to explicate the practice and even correct the practice in a way, no? Um, 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 I don't know. Theory don't, or don't logic? Know a word for it. Theory or uh, logic? I, I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to uh, say. I'm trying to talk about these two levels that you were talking about between. Yes. The what? What? Theory uh, Arman, and there is. There is. A, there is a something very subtle point here. That actually, logic is not theory. Sure. Logic is a meta theory. Right, sure. that yes. it comes back yes. to this. So it's a meta theory that can not only change the status of theory, but also by extension, the change the status of uh, practice. Essentially, Connor practice. doesn't doesn't want to be in that old Kantian pigeonhole where basically say that oh, theory yes. changes yes. The, the practice, but what if? The goddamn theory is itself constrained or limited in its own, and it's blind to its own limitations. So we have a triangle. We have a triad. We have no, we have no more uh, no more a two pole that have a feedback loop, right? Now we have a triad of um, absolutely triad of uh, absolutely. Absolutely. okay. Yes. Uh, so in this triad, but logic is the principle, right, for both practice and theory, as I understand you. Uh, meta, meta theoretical, I wouldn't say principle, but yes, uh, if, if you are fine with that word, uh, take it with a grain <laughs> of salt. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Friends, enemies. Uh, if not, if not at the very end, uh, I should just mention that we should kind of set up presentations. Um, oh, presentation! <laughs> I forgot uh, about that one. Yeah, and I don't think we have too many in this class either. So, uh, oh, which means that everyone is going to be tortured. Um, but I can set up a spreadsheet for that. But I think it would be good to get the first people like committed uh, now. 
because always when you do the spreadsheet, people who usually don't look at me while, while we are talking about presentations, they should be the first victims. And the first one, I can say that Connor, do you want to be the first victim? <laughs> We need one presentation and one and one respondent, I think, if that makes or maybe two. No, one, one, one is enough. One is enough. We don't want we don't want to go to the boundary, deep boundaries of the loose coldness and cruelty at this point. It's too early to be sadistic. <laughs> I haven't been waking up before this time for a while now so <laughs> this is torture right now. <laughs> um this is a, like a clerical question but um so for uh assigned reading or if there is any assigned reading where would i find oh assigned reading i haven't um found a good way to basically um get the text for the next sessions give me uh Saturday, max Sunday, I will send everyone an email with the assigned reading. But it obviously would be something about, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of glaring problems in our power that Karna becomes aware of and he becomes uh, obsessed with them, tries to resolve them. That makes sense. And then for the presentation, I'm not really sure about what did the, <laughs> I watched some of the lectures from uh, last course, but I'm not sure about what the standards are. Like, uh, what would you like? <laughs> and uh, do you want to give him a little bit of a tip? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think, I think it's not really uh, very strict, right? Um, but it would be best if you could kind of like summarize whatever the reading material is as part of that. And then if you have other things you want to say about it, I think that format generally tends to Look, work. Connor, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. <laughs> I could do it. I could do it. It's fine. It's perfect. We're great. OK, OK. Um, and we also need one person to respond to Connor, if that's all right. Yes. Uh, who wants to respond to Connor? Someone really nasty. Brian, do you want to do that? With a little bit of Loda and Tika and Karna, both at the same time. I don't know if I'm nasty enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Unfortunately not. <laughs> Enda, do you want to do that yourself? Uh, I don't mind. Yeah, I can go. If, um, yeah, if you'd like, I'm happy to do it. Uh oh. Okay. Excellent, magnificent. Um, and the, the only other admin thing to mention is that we have a, a Discord channel set up. So if people haven't been put on that, it's basically like a methadone clinic for Twitter users. So you can kind of like, we can have like an, you know, an additional conversation during the week. If people have like other questions and stuff, we can use it for that. What is this Discord thing? I, I, I haven't got anything. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll send you the... Um, Not that I'm going to join, but I just... Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's, it's like a server where you can uh, basically have a bunch of conversations and a bunch of channels. Uh, so you can kind of, um, it, it's kind of like a, a, an informal chat space, I guess. Uh, if that's like sense. with voice. Y yeah, well, you can use voice, but it's more like, I think most people use just like messaging and stuff on it. Okay, but, I, see, I, see, I see. Quite helpful for like if people have like questions as well about some of the stuff we talked about today and they want to like pursue further discussion outside of class, we can use it for that. Excellent. I'll, I'll send you, the, you can decide whether you want to join or not, Reza, or I'll get them to sign you. Send Most probably you. not, but nevertheless. <laughs> to shit posting on Twitter. <laughs> I, I, I can't go on Twitter. I'm, I'm busy these days. <laughs> I only go to self-promote once in a while. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, please uh, let me know. And most important thing, always ask question. It really doesn't matter. Look. This is the, I know that this is going to go on YouTube. So some of you might have uh, felt that, oh, you know, we don't want to end up on YouTube, but all the uh, next uh, 
uh, sessions will be private. So any sort of question you have, please bring it on. Uh, we, are, we are going to, uh, we don't want to go too fast to leave some of our friends behind, right? Uh, so, and, and of course, if you want me to slow down my um, teaching uh, speed, or for example, talk a little bit of more context, always, uh, you know, just say something either here or privately, whatever you are comfortable with. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Ciao. Thank you. Have a great day, Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.